Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to episode 135 of the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. Each and every week, I take questions from literally all over the world now, and I do my best to answer them. Uh, remember, I know a lot of people don't listen to the end, but uh, if you want to ask a question here on the podcast, it's podcast at DanJohnUniversity.com. Like I said, this is episode 135, so we're, uh, you know, sneaking up to our third year already. And uh, the questions this week and in the past few weeks have, are really good, and I think we all have a chance to learn something here. Our first question comes from John. John says this. He says, in 2014, you wrote the article, 10 Secrets to Building Mass, 10 Secrets. And you included a plan for a three-day full-body routine. I loved it because it's straightforward and basic and because I always get stronger when I use it. Uh, the only downside is that once I get started, I don't want to change after six or eight or sometimes even 20 weeks. I have two questions. So one of the things about the program, uh, Gentle Listener, uh, John is talking about, is it's three days a week where you focus on one body part each day, but you do the whole body every day. So three days a week. So let's just say Monday would be like maybe the upper body day. I'm just, just winging it right now. So um, on Monday, we might do five sets of five in the military press, uh, five sets of five in the weighted chin up. That's a very, that's a good workout by itself. Uh, three sets of five in the bench press, three sets of five in the row. But then you do one set of squats, one set of 10 in the squats. Uh, whatever your deadlift variation is, you do one set of that and whatever, a loaded carry variation. Okay, that's good. Wednesday might be, you know, one set of 10 in the military, one set of 10 in the pull-up, you know, a one set of 10, one set of 10. And then the squat workout is, you know, hard. I don't know, whatever hard is to you. Five sets of 10 in the back squat or something like that, which would be a hard workout. Uh, five sets of 12 would be uh, even harder. And then, a, you know, a hinge movement, a loaded carry movement. And then Friday, uh, maybe you would do a really hard deadlift and loaded carry day, but you'd still do push, a pull, and a squat. Um, it's a good program, and the questions he asks are actually pretty good in John's case. One, do you think this is a good program for an older lifter? I absolutely do. And I think, so one of the things I, I think of, the push movements, the pull movements, and the squat movements are hypertrophy movements. And that's why I think it's so important that you have a real good balance in those numbers. If you're doing five sets of five in a push, you should be doing five sets of five or more in a pull and five sets of five in the squat. Those numbers should be all about the exact same at the end of each week. So what's good about this for an older lifter is there is a good focus on hypertrophy. And the other thing too is that because there is a hinge and a loaded carry, you are working on some fast twitch muscle fiber, you're working on work capacity, but you're not overworking those qualities. So yeah, I do think a good program for an older lifter. Uh, my goal at this point are really just to maintain strength and size. Uh, and I tell you something, John, if, you, <laughs> if, if I have a secret to what I'm doing in my life is I've always been stronger than the normal of my age. And as we all decline, because I'm in my mid sixties now and we're, I'm declining, you know, I mean, that's just, that's just nature. Um, uh, but I still have that big gap over an untrained uh, uh, 65 year old. And that's something I always want to keep in, in your mind. Uh, do you think it's okay to stick with a program for half a year rather than changing every eight to 12 weeks? Uh, you can stick with this program probably a long time, John. When I wrote the article, I wrote it specifically for a certain question. Um, but if the one thing I would want you to do is uh, it, it maybe every, let's just say eight to 12 weeks would be my normal. That would be 12 weeks is right on the edge of uh, few people can get to 12 weeks. But what I would suggest for you, maybe every six, eight or 12 weeks, whatever works for you, uh, like just go to a different variation, like the classic one I always say from military press to incline press. Do that to whatever, six, eight, 12 weeks, whatever you can do. And then slide from incline to uh, decline if you have it or dips or, and then after that, maybe flat back, back bench press and then rotate back to the military. Um, and you can do the same for the push. Sadly in the squat, there's just not that many variations. Um, that's why I'm, I'm such a big fan of getting people do the overhead squat, 
uh, and the front squat because just so they'll have some more variations. And those two exercises work your flexibility and mobility. So John, good question. And thanks for kicking off a, a great episode 135 with a question that I really liked. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. So our next question is from Joanna. I have a vague memory of you mentioning in a previous episode that after an evening of imbibing, you hit some impressive numbers the next day with your lifting. Is this true? Uh, yeah, sadly, it's been more true. Um, but the stories I talk about in my books are two of my friends, one who broke the world record in the hammer and the other one who broke the world record in the discus, hung over the next day. Now, in my book, Attempts, um, that's right behind me, uh, I discuss this in more detail. In my new book, I talk about it again. And you can also see this uh, uh, at Dan John University. I think it's in advanced, e the, the program called Advanced Easy Strength Techniques, and it's called the Hangover Rule. So yeah, it is true. Um, and let's go through the question now. Yeah. Uh, because the same thing happened to me recently. After an evening of let's just say a fair amount of wine. God, I like you, Joanna. I somehow had one of the strongest feeling five, three, two days I've ever had the following morning. What in the heck? To be 100% clear, I'm not recommending this as a training technique, nor am I. This is just my general curiosity. What do you think is up with this? Are you as stumped as I am? I used to be, but I think I have an answer for it now, is that superlative performance we would like to say we should be able to plan it and, and train it and progress to it. And it really doesn't happen very often. You know, when I think about some of the greatest moments in sports history, um, and I'm sure a lot of people won't like to hear this, but when Tom Brady brought um, the Patriots back from uh, 26 or 22 points, whatever it was, uh, and kicked the field goal, Atlanta, and the game's over. Um, but, you know, you watch that, but it was only in that second half, in that moment. Uh, when you look at most throwing world records, rarely does it come when it's supposed to happen. Now, it is true, uh, uh, Nemeth uh, threw the world record on his opening throw at the Montreal Olympics in the javelin. Um, I think Sadiq broke a world record at the Olympics in the, in the hammer. Um, Krauser, I think, it, it might, all of a sudden I just, I can't, if I remember this is right or right, I think broke the world record in, you know, at a high level meet. I can't remember if it was the Olympic trials or the Olympics. And again, it doesn't matter. But rarely do Olympic, uh, do do people in the throws and then in the long jump and in the triple jump, uh, very often the, 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 the best marks of their life kind of come out of nowhere. Now in the high jump or pole vault, it's different because you know the mark. And what I think happens is, and, and Joanne, it's going to sound strange, but I think when you when you have a built-in excuse, oh, I'm not going to be able to do well today. I'm hungover. You know, uh, uh, you kind of turn the brakes off, and you just you know you do something and it feels right, and you you know you do a little more, and oh, I'm, this isn't so bad. And then you know you let you kind of let you kind of get out of your own way. So the hangover rule, I think, is it's a wonderful built-in excuse. And you do, you, you get out of your own way. And I think that's what causes it. Remember, if you want more information, uh, Dan John University, the, the course on easy strength, there's two in there. And I talk about it in depth. Uh, and basically, I don't think I answered most of it here. And if I forgot anything, th that's one thing about when I write stuff, I can always, you know, I can add in a little extra details, but that's the basics, okay? Great question. Thanks for asking. Uh, Preston has a question. He says, I have a question about the three sets of eight workout and the DeLorme protocol. Hey, one of my online friends found out something interesting about his neighbor the other day. It's Thomas DeLorme's son. I just find that so great. So, and, well, that's enough. You've written and talked about selecting the load for a three sets of eight workout by basing load on the third set. So all three sets are the same load. In an article you wrote for bodybuilding.com about the DeLorme protocol, the weight three sets of weight got heavier. Would the results of the two different workouts be similar? Do they have different purposes and goals? Also, would you structure a three sets of eight workout like the DeLone protocol template that you describe in the article? Vertical press, vertical pull, horizontal press, horizontal pull, squat. Huh? That would be a hard three sets of eight workout, but yeah, you could do that. So, okay, so 
one of the things about studying Thomas DeLorme, it's just like studying well, anybody in, the, in my field, including me, is he would say certain things in 1944 when he start, first started working with the, the, the guys who got blown up in World War II. By 1948, he had streamlined that quite a bit. The original plan was for every exercise, and he expected full body workouts, so nine exercises, 10 sets of 10. That was, his, that was it. Later, he figured out that's way too much and slid down to seven. Well, that's still 70 sets of squats three days a week, man. I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't know if I could do that. And then uh, he, he simplified it down to three sets of 10. And then, then he gave us two versions of what to do next. So three sets of 10 which most of us adopted into three sets of eight as time went on, which is another number DeLorme worked with uh, because, well, and honestly, because eight is a Fibonacci number and 10 is not. That's why I do it. Sadly, that's true. Um, and then he later moved, gave us this idea for general power and uh, what we would call hypertrophy, uh, size and strength, where you did a set of 10 at 50% of what you could do a set of 10 at. Then you did a set of 10 at 75, later lower to 70%. Uh, I don't know why, but I think there's one. And then you did that third set of 10. And here's the thing. And Brian Mann, who M-A-N-N -N, from University of Miami, uh, I think when he was at Missouri, came up with this. Mann studied this and found that that is still one of the most successful protocols. And Mann's idea was this. If on that last set of 10, that hard set of 10, if you only got six, obviously you need to lighten up next workout, okay? If you got seven, eight, I think, uh, and you're supposed to get a set of 10, you know, you kind of, okay, let's see what's going on. If you got nine, 10, 11, yeah, you're right now. You're in your wheelhouse. Stay that same weight next time. If you got 12, 13, 14, 15, you probably want to go up next workout. And if you got a lot more than uh, 13, 14, 15, 20, whatever, then you'd really want to really reconsider your what you thought was a set of 10. So I use three sets of eight with one minute rest. And I do that in the program I'm doing as I'm speaking today. It's called the Transformation Program. Um, Mondays, uh, three, well, day one, three sets of eight, one minute rest. I do power curls. That's a power clean with a curl grip. I do military presses. Uh, I do some other stuff, and but th that's the core of the workout. Wednesday, I do whip snatches. That's high hang power snatches. Three sets of eight with a minute rest. Then I do clean grip uh, snatches. Uh, basically, I slide the weight down to about one inch above my knee. Three sets of eight, clean grip snatch. Uh, three sets of eight. And then on Friday, which is a workout, it's hard. Three sets of eight with one minute rest in the front squat, and then three sets of eight, one minute rest in the overhead squat. And I flip the exercises each, uh, every other week. I flip, you know, uh, week one, that's the order. Week two, I just twist the exercises around. I make sure I work my abs hard on this program. And I do extra glute work, and I do extra uh, joint work. Uh, for me, curls and tricep extensions, uh, uh, I mean, uh, light hyper extensions, what, it, um, I don't know. It's to me, it's just making sure I got some lubrication in certain parts of my body. But yeah, those, those are very good workouts and you really can. Uh, it, it, it doesn't sound very sexy. Three sets of eight isn't sexy. The three set of 10, three sets of 10, three sets of 10 going heavier every time isn't very sexy. But like Brian Mann it talks about in his article, it works and it's always worked and we got to keep thinking it can work. It's not nearly as sexy as uh, the what a lot of the people who use extra supplements uh, take, but it, it works, okay? Great question. Thank you so much. We have a question from Gary. I finished 2021 completing 2,000 road miles, a 100-mile century ride, and a combined dead squat press bench of 1,000 pounds. Okay. I did this... Uh, test at the end of every year to make sure I'm maintaining, uh, gaining mobility, strength, and endurance as I age and manage small nagging aches and pains like most people do and follow Stu McGill's big three for my lower back. The pandemic closed our gym, but resulted in a 
a terrific group of people who stayed together and work out every day using parks, driveways, and now back in the gym. Uh, basically, it's the way I train. Uh, it makes me happy to, to read that, Gary. Uh, the posted workouts are all good, general quality, but not necessarily geared toward my annual test. I've been working around this by supplementing the group workout at my home gym with work that closes the push, pull, hinge, squat, heavy carry gaps that I think I have. Very good. Balancing all this gets a bit complex, and sometimes I wonder the real benefit. To me, the group workout is the top of the food chain for many reasons. And, and I think there's some truth to that, yeah. My question, is there a simpler approach to enjoying the community of the group workout while also working to towards my annual goal test? Yeah, I uh, I do the same thing. So, well, there, let me, uh, two examples. Uh, back when I was uh, with the Coyote Point Kettlebell Club, we only met once a week, and then we used to have a second, like, minor workout uh, for a group of us that were just, it was real easy. We just met at the park. Uh, it was no big deal at all. And so that's only two days a week, and I was able to get the work what I needed at the time, which is different than what I need now, by the way, which is interesting to think as I look back. Um, I also do things with a, with a community group uh, five days a week. And one of the things I have to do sometimes is I have to step back and do my own thing for an Olympic lifting meet or a Highland game. Um, I Like you, I choose to do those in extra. Uh, by the way, one thing I don't want you do, to do, uh, Gary, and this is important, I don't want you bench pressing by yourself at home, okay? Always, always have someone with you when you bench. A good spotter, always. Do that favor for me. But if you just did... Um, I mean, I don't know how many days a week you're doing the, the workouts, but if if it's three to five, you can easily supplement um, whatever you're not doing with them. And if it's loaded carries or squats or whatever, that should be simple. And you won't need much volume either. I mean, you could probably get away with three sets of three and, and take care of business, uh, by the way, which is a wonderful, wonderful workout, okay? Gosh, I hope that helps. I hope that answered your question. But uh, I think the answer is just going to be, you know, enjoy those workouts, you know, get your, get your sweat on, get your mobility on, and then focus, you know, one, two, three days a week on cleaning up the other stuff, and I think you'll be just fine. Okay? Thank you. Uh, we got a question uh, from Dan, lovely name, uh, quote, Dan John Form. I wish I would have done more bodybuilding work. I had a great conversation with Brian today about the importance of hypertrophy. I ignored it and paid a big price. So I agree with anyone mentioning Tommy Kono. Hey, Dan, I found this topic on the forum, and I'm curious if you would talk more about this. I have heard you bring it up in past conversations, mentioning those over 35 should just train like a bodybuilder. Probably at 35 is, is when you want to do the hard blend of things, just for clarity before I move on. So at 35, you probably still want to be working on... Uh, fast twitch muscle fibers as best you can work capacity as best you can um and but begin to slide into more and more bodybuilding when you get to about 55 plus you know it's going to be bodybuilding and uh hy hypertrophy work and mobility work and doing your best to to maintain what you can maintain you know i'm 65 man and it it there are days man you know, my, my, I work on fast twitch mus muscle fibers as much as I can, but, uh, you know, I got to be a little bit more careful about things like ankles and feet than I ever was. Okay. Um, should train like a bodybuilder. Can you talk more about it? I am 35 and I've been lifting for the past 15 years casually and five years with maturity and education. Hmm, maturity. My goal is to stay ready in my life and age gracefully. Yeah. So, I do wish, especially when I was with Dick Notmeyer, you know, like the week after an Olympic lifting meet, we used to go heavy in the Olympic lifts because often, you know, when you're working with a young, with a young lifter, they actually uh, do a lot better. Um, young lifters often will lift better the week after a weightlifting meet because you're just you're just constantly you know you're just one upping your own self. Um, that was fine for the first year I was with Dick, but after that, I would, I'd get back from meets and I'd be like, you know, he'd be, <laughs> I, I remember him trying to push me one time midweek and it was like, Dick, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm toast, you know, 
I wish I would have done more curls, bench press, you know, ab work, you know, instead of doing front squats, you know, and I just beat my wrists and elbows up even more. Uh, they don't, they don't, I mean, if you do Olympic lifting seriously, you just, you just start to get ground down. And Tommy Kona was the one who recommended you, you get yourself on an eight week program and you Olympic lift, um, the Saturday, the Saturday you finish that eight weeks, when you're driving home, you become a bodybuilder until the next eight week period comes up. And maybe it's only two or three weeks, maybe it's 16 weeks, but the idea is just to keep yourself fresh and your joints healthy. Um, at 35, you still have so far to go. Remember my best year as a discus thrower, I was 47. So, you know, this, this, this movie ain't over yet. Uh, keep enjoying things and keep pushing yourself a little bit. Good question, and thank you, my friend. We have a question from Sean. I'm 44 and had a question regarding clumsiness. Well, I'll see if I help you on this. I'm currently five weeks into a fat loss diet, and I'm doing hypertrophy training four days a week. I'm training hard. This week I fell off and have, I fell, I felt off, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. This week I felt off and have broken a plate and glass in the kitchen. I think it's from being depleted. Yeah. Okay. So I get what you're trying to say. Yeah. Uh, one of the signs that you, you might be tapping in too deeply into your reserves is when you start doing things. If you start finding yourself getting forgetful or you feel like you're going into, um, you know, like you're having a heart attack or something, that's you've went way too far. Okay. It's like, ah, I got it. You know what? And you get really angry at everybody. Uh, I've never, obviously, I'm too wonderful to ever been a grouch during a diet. Um, perhaps it is time for a deload and a few more calories. In your experience, have you had the issue of overtraining causing clumsiness? Sleep is excellent and food quality. Oh, so you're eating and sleeping well, but you're in a caloric deficit, but you're still struggling with clumsiness. It could be one other little issue, Sean, and that is the fact that you, um, okay, let me explain it this way. If you ever break your thumb, you discover how often your thumb hits everything in the universe. It's like if you hurt your elbow, you bump into everything. Uh, if you have a broken toe, everyone steps on it. Um, so when you, when you are moving into, um, a smaller state, it, it, there is some, um, the, the world does get, your orientation of things will change a little when your body composition leans out. Uh, I always think about, you know, in fact, I, there's a young man I was, I've been watching grow for the past few years. It's been kind of funny because just a few years ago, he's this tall, you know, and in about, a, no, I don't know, about a two year period now he's this tall. Well, and it's funny to watch him because he's a little bit more like a young horse, a colt. You know, where it's, it's like you can just see him when he moves. He kind of flops things around, doesn't know where they are. When you lose a lot of weight, the same kinds of things happen. Um, now, you're asking a good question. Is it time to take a pause in a diet? Boy, if you've been serious on a diet for five weeks, uh, I don't know how long this diet la is going to last you, but... I would tell you to finish it and then, you know, rethink everything. I hope you're not on a diet for the rest of your life here. Um, by the way, over the past two years, I've gone from 270 to 210. That's impressive. Built a kick-ass home gym and strong and looking great. Your work has contributed to, to that. Thank you. Well, thank you. God, that, that's, I would say, just by looking at this, going from 270 to 210, I think part of that, I think, I just think, I think your proprioception, uh, your relationship uh, with the world. Oh, hit, sorry, hit that. Oops, sorry, hit that. I think that could be part of it. Uh, hang in there on this diet. And I just have to salute and applaud you for that, uh, uh, that life change. Uh, you, you will be very happy about this long term. Congrats and thank you. Paul says this. Do you ever use overspeed eccentrics on the back swing of kettlebell swings? Well, obviously, you've never been to a cert with me because, yeah, I use them all the time. I use both the spike swing. That's where I hit the bell as hard as I can and th throw it back. And I also use banded swings. In fact, I, I'm working with the, he's a military guy and he's kind of a, you know, he's, 
He's on the he's 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 the tip of the point of the tip. Okay, he's and he's yeah he's he's the real deal, and uh, so he trains alone a lot. And I taught him how to do those banded swings, where you use the um, the the big elastic bands, and you hook them around your kettlebell. So every time you th throw the uh, you you hinge and snap the kettlebell up, the bands are actively pulling it back at you yeah so yes i do and i'm do you have any coaching cues to improve their effectiveness N yeah the problem with doing something over speed i think it helps to either have the band or me as a coach slapping that bell back at you um because it's over speed uh for example that's why i think if you can if you have a facility that has a gentle downhill now, of course, it's downhill going this way. It's uphill going that way. Most, it's, I'm, I was at a place one time where they, they didn't seem to completely understand that, and I thought that was interesting. But if you have a gentle downhill, and it's not, I still think running uphills, and I still think progressive resistance exercise is, is better. But some people have great success. There's a certain kind of running style that seems to be aided by overspeed downhill running, gentle downhill running, not, you know, not like I have here in Utah, you know, <laughs> Utah hills, you know, there's the, uh, it's hard to ride your bike in some parts because you either go straight up or straight down. But if you have a gentle downhill where you can go a little faster, I think it does help, but you need to, so you, you have to have, you know, I know that some people say, well, I just think it that way and I go faster. And I'm like, well, that's impressive because it's it's really hard to think over speed and make it work but you know that so if you can get someone to help you spike swing or you can try the banded thing uh let me know okay all right thank you bye we have a question from james james says i've always had good squat mobility but terrible shoulder mobility i have the slightly hunched posture typical of office workers being a couch potato for many years and only getting into exercise in my 20s, I'm now in my mid-30s. After listening to your podcast, I'd love to learn to overhead squat. I tried with a 20-pound, 20-kilo uh, bar once, and it wasn't really possible. I know you've recommended using lightweight PVC pipe and alternating with a goblet squat. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, but there's another issue, so let me finish his reading. I tried this, but I couldn't feel that I was doing much. My arms came forward a bit, that's flexibility, but without the bar weighing anything, there wasn't any consequence to this. Do you have some other mobility work first? Yeah, I'm surprised you, you don't know the answer. I'm, I'm sure some of my listeners and readers are going, Kawhi study, Kawhi study. Uh, will overhead squats improve his shoulder mobility over time? Oh, absolutely, if you take it seriously and you compete in Olympic lifting meets, because the bar is going to force you to hang. You you need to hang, my friend. Uh, James, uh, you know, find the pull-up bar and hang. And this is how I hang. People always ask me questions. I hang. So uh, do you have a flex tricep? I mean, like that? Yeah, not for 30 seconds. I hang. Sometimes I do the little twists. I bring my knees to my chest, uh, and that's an actual great ab exercise and lower back mobilizer. Got to tell you one thing. I was doing the hang, and I had brought my knees to my chest one time, and I had this lower back crack um, adjustment for you chiropractors in the audience, and it just went, and it, honestly, I just felt like a new person. Um, hang, 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 hang. Uh, I would suggest if you go to my post-deployment program and just follow the advice in there. Start off with 30 seconds, one set of 30, slide up to, you know, two sets of 30, three sets of 30, you know, just use it as progressive resistance. And according to the Kawhi study, it, you actually will change uh, your shoulder mobility doing this. And I, I found it to be true in my case, and I love it. So try that, okay? Pretty simple. I do it every day. My warm up is hanging and sit in the bottom of goblet squats. It's not very high end, but damn, it works good. All right, thank you. Good question. We have a question from Jeffrey with the J, 
And there's a lot to it, so I'll answer as we go through. So I don't want to lose my audience. Jeffrey with a J says, I'm a 58-year-old guy who just completed your 10,000 swing challenge with the 24. Thanks for the motivation. You are welcome. During this challenge, I did nothing special to supplement my diet, and I didn't have any issues. Felt great before, during, and afterwards. No weight gain or loss. Same thing with me. Uh, it's a nice workout. I honestly don't get anything measurably improved. But once I finish that, usually on January 19th, because, you know, January 1st to the 19th is 20 days. I put the bell down for the last time and I say to the universe, God, I hate that damn thing. And yet almost instantly after the next few weeks, I notice that my training discipline is better and I'm sharper in all kinds of things. So yes, I get nothing out of the 10,000 swing challenge, except it is the best setup for my year. So I'm with you. I generally average 50 to 60 grams of protein a day, all from food intake, no supplements or age onset meds yet. So my question is this, for future challenges and training programs, should I look to increase protein intake? Uh, you don't tell me your weight here, my friend. Um, 50 to 60 grams. Some would say you're on the lower end. I would say that certainly isn't very high, but if you if if you feel good and you look good, then you know hang in there. Pat Flynn would tell you that when in doubt, increase your protein when you're and and I think there's some wisdom on that. Um, I see some crazy numbers folks are taking in over the internet these days. Some go as high as one gram per pound of body weight. Yeah, I'd have a hard time doing that with food. That would be hard. Seems extreme, possibly dangerous. Well, <laughs> I mean. I don't know how many, I mean, I don't know how many grams there are in a, in a tin or can of protein, but I mean, a can of tuna, but, uh, well, you just stack, stack those up and just look at it and just see if you could do that. That'd, that'd be hard. I've always read that about 30 to 35 grams per meal is all we can effectively absorb. Uh, I've heard that that number has been made up out of the air, just like that number 220 minus your age for heart rate. They just, you know, the, the, the inventor of Universal just invented that number. Uh, in this field, we're good at inventing numbers that become truth. Um, the people who do the warrior diet tell me all the time, no, you can eat a lot more protein, you know, and uh, do fine. Uh, warrior diet is that where you basically have one meal a day. Uh, you have one feeding window a day, about a four-hour period. So fast for 20, eat for four. Um, so is extra protein above 69 grams necessary or beneficial? Oh boy, that's, you know, back in the early nineties, there was a company that sent you these sticks and, the, the, and there was a big formula with it. And I remember it well, but, um, you, you, you peed on these sticks and they would give you amount of your, your, urea protein it was like and i think it was the colors were blue yellow and green and what you did was you figured out you know how much protein i have a day how many hours I, it was a big formula that's why i didn't follow up it was too much work and uh you, you pee on the stick and the stick told you you know if you needed less or more protein uh, obviously since they're not around anymore it and one of the things we did, just been working on it, just doing the math, you know, just filling out the paperwork, you know, is you got a sense of um, a lot of people who think they were getting very little protein in a day turned out when you truly add it up, we're getting a lot. And some people who thought they were just shoveling protein down every meal, they were shoveling a lot of carbohydrates down every meal and not really getting very much protein. So that was kind of a cool thing. So... Is it necessary? You know, this is going to be, this is going to be your little voyage of one in some ways. Um, generally, more protein, more veggies, more water answers a lot of questions. Uh, I don't want to get too specific because you are a study of one, but I, it might be something you want to look at. You could do something as simple as a small protein supplement. Maybe find, uh, you know, find a, Find a, a fairly good company with like a protein bar that's a little bit, 
uh, I, I don't want you to eat one that's, you know, 70 ca uh, protein grams. I, something that's maybe 20. And then be very specific about your timing on it. Um, let's see. Do I have a weight on you here? Um, okay, we don't. But maybe something as simple as uh, maybe you can find a protein bar that's got 20 grams of protein, even 25. And take it maybe before you work out. According to my friend Tom Fahey, there is a window of time where it does help to have protein in workouts. Uh, we experimented with a number of different things. If you do have a protein, you can do it a little easier with drinks. Uh, you get you get the drink. Uh, you know this is this is iced tea. But so you, you if it's a thirty gram of protein drink, you drink a third maybe twenty minutes before the workout. You drink a third halfway through the workout, and the minute the second you finish, you try to drink the other third. Um, uh, we also experimented, and this one actually worked really well for teenage lifters. Um, <clears throat> you drink um, a watered down protein drink right before you go to bed, so that so you know uh, so it makes you want to pee, and then you drink uh, at about four in the morning. You drink a protein drink. Better have it ready to go. You're not getting up at three in the morning to go pee and then make a protein drink. It's got to be ready to go. And some of my athletes have had great success with drinking a protein protein drink. Basically, getting out of bed. I mean, just boom, you know. Uh, now that there's so many protein drinks available, the one I get at the store has 30 grams, and it's very consumable. It's about that big with 30 grams of protein. I can't, I'm not going to tell you the name, and I can't guarantee how good it is, but I got to tell you, it, it, could, it could be a game changer for you. So there's a couple ideas. So one, get a reasonable protein drink, you know, something that's not, whatever whatever works for you and do do experiments with this so try the pre workout maybe give it a week or two try middle give it a week or two try post workout give it a week or two then slide to maybe protein when you first get up protein before you go to bed i'm not going to tell you to do the protein middle very few people can make that work and then at the end of that, say, seven, eight, nine week experiment, kind of just go back and say, you know, I felt, and, and then find the one that worked the best. And usually I recommend people is interesting. Find the one that you didn't think worked at all, the one that you felt that nah, didn't work. And keep the one that worked the best, and that will just be a regular. And try the one that worked the worst with the one that worked the best and see how that combination goes. Uh, I know that sounds crazy. But oddly, sometimes, so if you have six protein interventions, pre, middle, post, pre-workout, pre-sleep, middle of the night, middle of the workout, waking up in the morning, finishing the workout. So that gives you six different options. One generally works great for you, and that one might not work for me or that person. But the one that might have worked worse during this little experiment might have just been timing or it needed more of a boost. Um, and what you try to do is, okay, and then and then you can kind of see where we're going. So keep the one that you like best. And by the way, that may change over time. So prepare yourself for that. If you do the one that didn't work at all and it, you still can't stand doing it like middle of the night wake up one, toss it out, try another one. Try the one that you, you, you maybe work fifth best, fourth best, and then try to find that. There might be a combination that works really good for you at a very small amount of protein. Like maybe, I mean, honestly, it could be as simple as um, a third of that little protein drink before a workout and a third after might be the best thing you ever did in your life. Whereas this company that sells protein supplements is telling you to take 20 times that much. Uh, we are unique enough that uh, the protein timing experiments, uh, I can't always give you a full answer either way. Boy, I, I maybe went too far on that question, but I, I liked it. I appreciate it. And thank you, Jeffrey. Well, there we go. Episode 135 is in the books, as we say, or on the video. And remember, if you have questions, podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'll do my best to answer each and every one. Uh, I like these questions. Uh, I think if you watched my earlier episodes, I struggled sometimes because the questions were uh, 
a, maybe a tiny bit too vague for me, but these new ones are great. Again, thank you. I'm Dan John from danjohnuniversity.com. Sign up. Uh, the workout generator by itself is the answer to all your problems. Uh, and until next time, uh, keep on lifting and learning.